So hello everyone, it's my pleasure being with you today. Uh, we are going to uh, address the recent therapeutic advances in the field of neuromuscular disorders. Uh, these are my disclosures. So I'm basically a clinician dealing with uh, neuromuscular patients in Paris, France. But I'm also a faculty in various uh, educational uh, events, as you can see here and also working for an industry as a consultant. Uh, for those of you who are not very familiar with uh, the concept of neuromuscular disease, uh, here are the, the main uh, definitions of uh, this group of uh, conditions. Uh, they're based on the fact that they are, there's always an impairment of the component of one component of the motor unit. The common denominator is paralysis. Uh, they can be extremely variable in terms of severity or prognosis. They're usually regarded as rare, but taken together, they're not so rare. It can affect uh, children and adults. And the vast majority of them are genetically determined, as we will see. They are rarely curable, but some of them are, might be significantly uh, treatable. Um, again, this is another schematic view uh, of the definition of, ne of neuromuscular disorders. This represents the motor unit uh, with the horn cell, uh, the peripheral nerve here, the neuromuscular junction, and the muscle fiber itself. So when any of these components getting uh, defective or uh, faulty, then there will be an issue and there will be a neuromuscular disease. So in terms of uh, conditions, um, the main message on this cartoon is the fact that <clears throat> there's a constellation of uh, neuromuscular disorders ranging from the anterior cell uh, disease represented by spinal muscular atrophies and uh, ALS and other bulbous spinal uh, atrophy to the extreme end of the spectrum with um, the primary muscle fiber disorders represented by muscular dystrophies and myotonic uh, syndromes and so on and so forth. And in between you have the neuropathies and myasthenias, whether the immune form or the uh, genetically determined form. Uh, so the message is that we're dealing with a very heterogeneous group of uh, conditions. Some of them are genetic, as we said, but others are disimmune. And uh, each of them, in theory, would require a specific therapeutic uh, intervention. Uh, this, this explains why it's a bit complicated, actually, to, to treat uh, so many uh, different diseases at the same time. Hopefully, and at least in the field of hereditary uh, neuromuscular disorders, uh, advances have been uh, uh, dramatic for the last 30 years or so. Uh, remember uh, in 1986 when we discovered for the first time uh, the gene uh, encoding dystrophin, the, uh, the protein responsible for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, that was, well, this raised uh, great hope among scientists and families and Everyone actually was very excited about that. Um, but at the time, remember that we only had a supportive approach uh, based on ventilation support or whatever, cardiac uh, uh, therapies and so on, but nothing really specific and really targeting uh, the disease itself. Uh, nowadays, hopefully, um, we have a, 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 an immense number of genes. I mean. Uh, which have been either mapped or cloned. Uh, and uh, more importantly, um, for many of those diseases now, we have various uh, therapeutic options, as we will illustrate during this talk. Some of them are gene therapies, others are just based on pharmacology, uh, and others, but not nowadays, when probably in the future or in the near future, will be based on the cell therapies. Um, never forget that even though, um, especially in children, uh, the majority of such disorders are genetic uh, by nature, um, a number of them are not, and they are just acquired or said disimmune based on the, the, the presence of uh, autoantibodies against every component of the uh, motor unit. And obviously, this is uh, more an issue in uh, grown-ups. Uh, rather than in children, but still, 
uh, we do know children suffering from such diseases and uh, hopefully we can treat them and we can very often cure them from, from this disease. I'm saying that because again um, advances in the immune mediated myopathies uh, have been significantly important for the past 30 years or so uh, at a time when the, the, the notion of uh, myositis was a little blurred, a little complex, uh, a little misleading as well and um, progressively scientists and clinicians have discovered a, a, a myriad of uh, antibodies which are no, now more specific to each subtype of myositis and this is just illustrated on this timeline and uh, I'd like to draw your attention for instance especially in children um, on new entities based on the discovery of such uh, autoantibodies and for instance the immune mediated necrotizing myopathy which emerged as a new entity just 10 years ago um, most specifically in, in adults with um, exposure to statin therapy but nowadays we need we know that it also exists in children and this particular disease is amenable to uh, uh, steroids and, and immunosuppressors to really alleviate symptoms in, in such children. So in a way it is a treatable uh, immune disease in children and to do that you just need to to uh, at least screen two types of uh, autoantibodies namely SRP and HMGCR and if they're positive then that's it you have the diagnosis and it should be p part of, the, of your workup nowadays. Now the, these are the Ten Commandments in myology. Um, the, I think the first priority is to to recognize if the disease you're dealing with is, is treatable or not. Okay, that's number one. Uh, second, you need to establish if it is genetic or not. And if so, you, you, you must actually uh, provide genetic counseling to the family. Um, because many of these diseases are complex and, and difficult to treat, I think the best is really to refer the, the patient to specialists and there are now many of them uh, widespread in various countries and various uh, networks and uh, you will always find a, an expert center somewhere. And in this center there will be uh, a multidisciplinary approach, there will be a holistic approach, uh, they will avoid uh, unnecessary investigations of course and they will follow standards of care which are now uh, internationally established uh, uh, and, and where there is some sort of consensus. Never forget that uh, treatment is also uh, meaning prophylactic in other words you can prevent uh, many conditions you can prevent many complications in such patients. Try to be empathetic and finally, and that's probably the point we're going to uh, elaborate now, is that you need to prescribe evidence-based therapies, okay? You need to be scientific and not just prescribe whatever you want. No, you need to, to read papers, you need to, to be convinced of um, the um, proof of concept and the, 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 the outcome of each uh, clinical trial. Um, as you may remember, uh, they were an elastil, uh, many preconceived ideas about uh, neuromuscular disorders and the way we can or we cannot treat them. Uh, they had and they still have to some extent a bad reputation because they were said to be non-curable diseases, especially the genetic disorders. Um, on top of that, there is still a lack of biomarkers to monitor uh, the, the clinical effects, for instance, or the, just the outcome of, uh, of each clinical trial. This is a real uh, issue, as we will see. And we also thought uh, that because they were too rare, um, the, the pharma wouldn't be interested in, in, in joining the, the effort to tackle them. But in fact, uh, and that's what we're seeing now, uh, there are more and more neuromuscular conditions which are amenable to treatment um, and we'll see that, including genetic ones of course, but also there are many dysimmune uh, neuromuscular conditions that I mentioned such as dermatomyositis and, and many others. Now be careful uh, when you deal with uh, um, cure, therapy, clinical trials, so on and so forth, uh, you have to be uh, cautious 
because every well especially parents and and and, and patients may be confused uh, a cure remember uh, is something able to lead to full rec recovery whereas a therapy or a treatment is just able to improve the condition okay um, a clinical trial is not a therapy in itself okay we're just doing a trial we're just going to see whether a, a medication uh, works or just modifies the natural uh, course of the disease uh, as I said before uh, prophylaxis prevention are really part of uh, our therapeutic options and should be uh, considered and um, approval when it means when a drug is approved doesn't mean that the drug is going to be reimbursed and that's a big issue especially in in countries where the healthcare systems are not that uh, powerful and finally and we'll come back to it uh, uh, repeatedly um, hope uh, is different from hype in other words uh, yes we're going to 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 see that many of this um, new drugs or new medications are promising and exciting outcome but at the same time we have to be cautious and to be um, and to take every information carefully okay otherwise we will just end up with uh, false hopes and that would not be uh, good for families and patients um, this is just to remind you that all this process from uh, the bench uh, work to um, to approval of a drug or a medication takes time uh, you're probably familiar with the different phases of a clinical trial from phase one two three and final approval and uh, uh, just to see how long it takes I mean it takes approximately on average uh, 10 years or more uh, from patent to launch in other words um, this is too long for parents okay we're not in the situation like in COVID where things are going very fast here you have to to, to process slowly uh, step by step and it's 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 hard to to, to work with uh, now never forget as well that uh, only 10% roughly of all medications that are going to be tried uh, and developed in the clinical setting will not be marketed I mean it will be marketed it means that the 90% left will not be marketed I will skip that one so just as a result of that and just to give you a, a broad view of, of the problem um, as I said there's a growing number of neuromuscular conditions that are now uh, amenable to therapeutic options you can see them uh, we're going to address more specifically four of them as we'll see in a minute but look look at the, 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 the this ever-growing list of conditions for which the clinician uh, can be and has to be uh, active and, and, and proactive in terms of uh, therapies now um, drug pricing this is an issue as you all know uh, I just listed here uh, four examples or five examples uh, from very cheap medications very cheap interventions to very very expensive drugs uh, for instance vitamin b2 that we use for riboflavin deficiencies is just you know pocket full of, of, of US dollars uh, yearly uh, salbutamol as well if you use it either in CMS and sometimes in SMA um, but when it starts with um, when it comes to atelurin, nucinus, and solgensmad, the, the cutting edge therapies that we're currently using uh, in these conditions, uh, we are now uh, approaching skyrocketing uh, prices, such as 300,000 US dollars a year, or even $2 million for one shot of gene therapy uh, for uh, SMA, for instance. So, this is a real, well, this is the real world. We have to, to deal with that. We all know that the price doesn't reflect necessarily uh, the manufacturing costs because other costs matter as we all know uh, research and development uh, promotion so um, I'd, like to, I'd like to remind you that pricing and reimbursement are also negotiated in each country so it's it's difficult to have a very global view of the drug pricing issue uh, but still yeah, you have to to deal with that 
and it's not often a competitive market because all these orphan drugs benefit from special protective status at least for a number of years. So in terms of access to to, to therapies, uh, this is a growing issue, as we all know, for SMA patients or even Duchenne patients. If you live in a country where uh, all this is not available, it's going to be very frustrating, as we all know. Now, uh, trying to be more uh, specific, um, I'd like to uh, show you what's happening now in four uh, different diseases, okay? namely Pompe disease, riboflavin deficiency, spinal muscular atrophy, and Duchenne muscular, at, uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, sorry, DMD. Okay, Pompe disease, what's that? Well, that's a metabolic uh, myopathy. Uh, it's also called a acid maltase deficiency or glyc glycogen storage disease type two, or alpha glucosidase deficiency, all those are synonyms. Um, we distinguish two forms uh, based on the age of onset and the severity of symptoms, uh, the so-called infantile onset Pompe disease, which is present in newborns and in infants, and the late onset Pompe disease uh, from children, adolescents and adults, and the cutoff is usually uh, one year of age. Okay, keep this in mind. Um, you probably remember that um, Pompe disease is due to the to the accumulation of glycogen in various tissues, including uh, the muscle tissue, and that leads to a progressive uh, degeneration of uh, muscle fibers, leading to muscle weakness, uh, cardiac disease, and and early death, as we all know. So um, this is again a, a continuum of symptoms, uh, because Pompe disease, as I said, is is divided in IOPD and LOPD, um, you have a major cardiomyopathy in, in the earliest forms of this disease, whereas um, in, in late onset, very late onset forms of Pompe disease, the, the main issue is about muscle weakness, respiratory uh, insufficiency, and not much the, the, the cardiac uh, compromise. So we know that, we also know that all this is correlated pretty well with the uh, uh, residual activity of the acid alpha glucosides here represented by percentages here. Uh, so obviously the, the kids, the infants, the newborns which present with uh, early symptoms are usually those who have a very low, uh, close to 0% of uh, alpha glucosides uh, activity. Uh, this is just to illustrate uh, uh, what uh, pediatricians and neonatologists in particular uh, see in the in their clinic. Uh, it's all about either newborns or very young infants presenting with uh, severe muscle weakness. Um, they have a cardiac, uh, cardiac disease manifesting as a cardiomyopathy with heart uh, enlargement on, a, on an x-ray. Uh, and unfortunately, many of these kids are overlooked in the sense that uh, the, the clinicians don't think of uh, Pompe disease immediately because it's pretty, uh, pretty rare. And uh, the child, uh, unless you, 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 you screen them with a DBS, a dry blood spot for, to measure the as, uh, acid alpha glucosidase activity, uh, you will miss the diagnosis. Um, if you perform a muscle biopsy, but nowadays it's no more uh, necessary, you will find that uh, the muscle fibers are just invaded by all sorts of vacuoles full of uh, glycogens, and uh, the ultimate diagnosis will be, or will rely on the presence of uh, mutations in uh, the GA gene. So all this is well known, even though, uh, as we can see here, the, 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 the delay diagnosis is, uh, is pretty, pretty, uh, pretty long. I mean, uh, uh, many of these kids are diagnosed uh, three, four, six months before, uh, after uh, first symptoms. So hopefully, uh, and you know that, uh, we have a, a, a therapy for that. It's the enzyme uh, replacement uh, therapy, the ERT. Um, the drug has been approved uh, both in Europe and in the United States 
that was uh, almost 15 years ago, or more than that. Uh, yeah, 15 years ago. Um, and um, the, the data were pretty much convincing in, in children where, uh, first of all, they survived. And second, uh, a, a good number of them, not all of them, but a good number of them uh, improved at the motor uh, level. Uh, interestingly, if you perform the ERT, then uh, you're going to wash out the glycogen from the different muscle cells, especially the muscle fibers here, or even the, on the heart. As we can see here, the heart after ERT will uh, come back to normal and will be functioning properly. So we do have a treatment in ERT, in uh, IOPD, in infantile onset uh, pompe disease. Uh, as I said, the data are just convincing. Uh, uh, several patients, uh, approximately 30%, which is not ne negligible, have achieved independent inhalation. It was quite unexpected. And, uh, but uh, taken overall, uh, the efficacy has also been demonstrated in an advanced stage uh, population. Of course, um, if you want to be uh, really effective, you need to treat early. Uh, and again, uh, we have to diagnose these children early, and it's not very, very easy. Uh, and of course, if you arrive late, and if you treat late, uh, then you won't improve the, the clinical uh, features. So many uh, factors um, uh, interfere with that, the cream status, the circulating antibodies, the level of the residual uh, GAA activity, uh, dosing, the genetic background might be also a confounding factor and the glycogen influx. Uh, generally speaking, the, the drug is uh, well tolerated, hopefully. And these are the current challenges that we face in uh, Pompe disease, especially in infantile form. Uh, again, the uh, issue of early diagnosis. Uh, although some countries, as we know, have implemented a newborn screening program to detect uh, such uh, cases uh, earlier on. Um, the problem of immune response, yes, uh, especially for those who are crime or crime uh, negative. Um, some uh, investigators are, have chosen to dose, to double the dose if um, the, the patient didn't respond uh, fast to uh, ERT. We also observed uh, new phenotypes in those kids treated for many years with the ERT, uh, which seems to escape the, 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 the therapeutic uh, impact uh, of the drug for which uh, we, we have a challenge either to, to increase the dose or just to stop the, the ERT or to move or switch to another um, uh, drug on the market. Uh, again, access to treatment is still an issue in many countries, especially in the emerging world. And uh, there's now a, a growing uh, number of ethical issues. Uh, and I just selected one, uh, for instance, when Again, we, we, we just see that the ERT is not that uh, efficient. Uh, should we discontinue it or, or not? This has to be discussed with the family. Uh, we, we, this issue was even uh, more, more prominent uh, recently with the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic where parents were pretty reluctant to go to hospital every two weeks to get the treatment. And then some of them really decided to stop and so on. Now, the, the more exciting uh, news about uh, this uh, therapy is that we are now uh, close to using um, a new or a, a second generation uh, ERT uh, drugs, such as the neomycin and uh, probably others. Um, they might be more uh, potent to, to wash out the glycogen uh, from, from the cells. We'll see that. Well, the, the, the data in the first clinical trials seem to be very promising, so we'll see. Uh, we can use, or we will use the chaperone-like molecules, and uh, there's at least one or two labs, two farmers uh, interested in, in that. Uh, 
And finally, uh, and this is uh, again very promising, uh, there are there's now I think two different pilot programs of gene therapy uh, in Pompe disease by two different uh, biotechs, uh, Spark, uh, another one. Um, and uh, the preclinical uh, data are, are quite uh, amazing and, and very encouraging, I must say. Now, just two words about the late onset Pompe disease. Uh, again, uh, as clinicians and especially as child neurologists, you may encounter uh, these uh, this, uh, patients because um, they do have a, a, a deficiency in GAA, but it is less prominent and the symptoms are not exactly the same as uh, the infants, okay? They may have limb girdle weakness, but they also have uh, some respiratory uh, deficiency which may be the, the presenting symptom, or oh, they can even just be uh, asymptomatic uh, uh, with the hypersarcemia. Uh, some, some of them have rigid spine, ptosis, chronic fatigue syndrome, in other words, uh, rather unspecific uh, symptoms, and that's why many of them are, are diagnosed late or misdiagnosed, and that's a common uh, feature in many of them. And uh, in terms of uh, treatment, um, the, the therapy is probably less less uh, less um, effective than in IOPD. We can see that. Perhaps on ventilatory uh, uh, support, you may gain something in terms of uh, autonomy and things like that. But for motor function, well, it depends. It can be dramatic in some of them, but especially in the late, very late onset, the 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 improvement is, is uh, I shouldn't say minimal, but uh, questionable. Uh, these are just, as a reminder, the symptoms and signs seen in children and adults with LOPD. As you can see, there's a myriad of symptoms and signs uh, dealing with respiration, with uh, muscle function, with heart, and with gastrointestinal uh, manifestations as well. So I'm just showing that, that those patients exist uh, you have to treat them uh, with um, the ERT, the, the currently available one, but perhaps with the, the most sophisticated ones in the future. And uh, you can really make a huge difference for your patients, at least in some of them. Now, the second group of uh, uh, disease I'd like to uh, show is uh, riboflavin deficiency. Remember, uh, these um, deficiencies are part of the bulbous spinal SMA group, okay? Uh, these are the classical, so opposed to the classical 5Q uh, SMA, it's a, it's a limited number of, of uh, conditions here, the bulbous spinal F SMA. They are divided in at least four different entities, or five here and we're going to focus on the, the forms seen in childhood, uh, namely the Fasciolonde syndrome and the brown valletto uh, van Lair syndrome. So this is the BVVL, as we, uh, since we use the, the acronym. It's a progressive pontocerebellar palsy uh, with sensory neural deafness, to make it simple. Um, it's a devastating disease, it's early death, they have dysphagia, deafness, uh, muscle weakness. So yes, it's 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 a very very uh, bad disease. The difference between Fasciolonde syndrome and Brown Violetto van Lens syndrome is very simple, um, in the sense that uh, in BVVL you have deafness, and in Fasciolonde you don't have it. Okay, but basically they are. Um, overlapping in terms of uh, other clinical manifestations. So it's a recessive disease and it's uh, related to defects in at least two different genes and this is just one that I mentioned. And um, we, own, we, we know that the, the defective genes are two transporters of the riboflavin, the so-called vitamin B2. Um, these are the two genes, okay? 
and more importantly uh, the, both syndromes are amenable to vitamin B2 supplementation and each works perfectly if you um, give high dose sometimes very high doses of uh, such uh, vitamin uh, your patient is going to improve dramatically especially in the motor uh, performance not much on deafness but still uh, and this drug as I said is extremely cheap you can find it uh, everywhere sometimes on the internet as well at a reasonable uh, cost and obviously the earlier the treatment is initiated uh, the better is the outcome so all this has been showed nicely by various groups uh, across the world and uh, this is just one example of uh, a paper we published years ago about the, the positive outcome of such supplementation. So um, the latest advances in, in, in such a group of uh, disorders is that we have expanded the spectrum of clinical uh, phenotypes uh, to quite unexpected uh, presentations such as pseudo disimmune uh, forms of uh, BVVL uh, mimicking uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome or CIDP. Uh, others present just like juvenile uh, ALS or sometimes pseudo mitochondrial. Uh, we have also expanded uh, the age uh, range in terms of uh, uh, we have of course um, described the disease in infants first but nowadays we also have uh, adult onset uh, forms of uh, riboflavin deficiency all uh, responding well to uh, vitamin B2. And uh, another point is that the fact that the NGS study are now identifying a growing number of patients, as we all know. So, uh, spinal muscular atrophy, uh, that's the third one. Um, what's happening there? Um, you all remember, I guess, the traditional classification of uh, spinal muscular dystrophy in different types, type 1, type 2, type 3, based on the, the age of onset, based on the uh, maximal uh, uh, motor uh, achievement in such kids, whether they can uh, hold the head or sit uh, independently or just walk. Um, actually, it's a continuum of uh, severity times, as we all know, um, I'm not going to, to describe all this, but you, you know that within this broad or large groups, you have subgroups okay, that we're using uh, to, uh, first of all, classify the disease, but also for our uh, clinical trials. So uh, keep in mind that the type 1s are the, the, the most prevalent ones, uh, followed by uh, type 2 and, and, and type 3. There is a type 4 but it's, 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 it's just like the type 0, they're extremely rare. Uh, but please note that uh, phenotypes are currently changing with the advent of uh, these novel uh, therapies. You obviously uh, know that we have a very robust genetic test to uh, confirm uh, SMA, and for that we, we screen the SMN1 gene and we see that there's a deletion. It's usually a homozygous deletion. There are tricky cases with uh, point mutation, but you can either forget forget them. But what's more important uh, nowadays is the, the the fact that we need to screen as well the SMN2 copy number because it's a, a nice biomarker. Uh, it's a, a way to know about, about the prognosis of the disease and the more SMN2 copy you have uh, the better in terms of uh, clinical uh, phenotype. Um, so as you all know we are just um, facing an ongoing uh, therapeutic revolution in SMA. We have three drugs which have been approved uh, both by FDA and EMA, uh, Spinraza, Solgensmer and Everest-Dees uh, manufactured by three different uh, companies. Uh, the first two showing uh, dramatic impact on survival of type 1, that's for sure. And at this point, and this is just a personal view, um, the oligos are probably more appropriate for type 1 and type 2. Zolgen smell is targeting more specifically type 1 and perhaps, we don't know yet, uh, type 2 patients. Uh, whereas RISD plan, that is FRSD, 
uh, targets more type 2 and type 3. But all this is moving, you know, because there's a growing number of patients being exposed to these drugs. Uh, there are still ongoing clinical trials. and uh, So this is the, 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 the landscape of SMA nowadays. Uh, we have many companies, we have many uh, uh, different approaches based on um, SMN2 or not, and, and so on. So all this is very exciting. It's a little bit complex, but for clinicians and for families, uh, it, it, it is a reality. I mean, the, you have to discuss this when you face them in the, your, your clinic. Um, just a few words about the oligos, that is the, the, the way to, uh, to change uh, the, the production of the uh, SMN uh, protein. Um, just as a reminder, this is the SMN1 gene, the one which is deleted, and this is the SMN2 gene, a parallel gene, which resembles uh, quite a lot uh, the, the, the SMN1 gene, uh, but which doesn't incorporate uh, the XN7 in its, um, in its uh, M mRNA, the messenger RNA, and therefore the protein uh, which is produced here is not very functional. Uh, so the, the principle of uh, oligos in, uh, in SMA is to uh, use them to reincorporate exon 7 into uh, the final uh, SMN2 mRNA messenger. And this messenger will be full length and will produce a full length protein, the one which is going to be uh, useful for motor neurons. That's the way it works. It's been shown very nicely. The, the, the only issue is that you have to give this intrathically, so it's it's a burden, both for the the patient and for yourself, especially when there's a, a scoliosis. The scientific evidence uh, of the positive impact of uh, such a medication, such a medication, has been proven in various uh, clinical studies uh, that are showed here: uh, Endia, Cherish, Nurture, Embrace, and many other ancillary uh, studies. And uh, and I'm not going, sorry, to comment uh, all of them, but um, the, the various uh, studies showed some improvement in terms of motor milestone scores uh, measured by either Heine or by the Choppington. Um, and it's true here, if you look at the, the, the two studies uh, related to nurture, nurture study on pre-symptomatic uh, children, then, um, the, the, the earlier you intervene, the better you are in terms of uh, improvement, okay? Now, what's the, uh, the latest news about uh, Spinraza, that is the Olicos? Um, as I said, it's, it's been approved. The, the pricing policy is still debated, but it's not specific to, to, to buy gene and to this particular drug. We have the same issue with the, the other very costly uh, medications. Uh, and uh, so far, uh, 11,000 uh, patients with SMA have been exposed to spinreza worldwide. And again, the, the safety profile uh, seems to be very, very good. Now, the second approach uh, in SMA nowadays is uh, uh, SMN gene, SMN1 gene transfer. Okay, this is the, 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 the trans gene that we're using. It's the name which is extremely difficult to pronounce, the onasomnesia in B. Povovic, in other words, Zolgensmer. Uh, it's uh, now manufactured and, and, and marketed by Novartis. Um, so the, the SMN, uh, well, the SMN1, which is the human SMN gene, is, is there, flanked by various uh, pieces of DNA or RNA to, to, to make it work. And it's an adeno associated viral vector, okay, AV9, which is uh, very good and very appropriate because it crosses the blood brain barrier and it targets neurons. It's non integrating and uh, non pathogenic, and it has a rapid, sustained uh, expression of the SMN protein, which is essential for motor neurons. And all this remains stable within the nucleus for many years. Um, so I'm not going to explain you how gene therapy works, but basically you, you just need one infusion, okay, intravenously, at least at this stage, uh, and the vector will, in which the, the, the transgene has been incorporated 
will be sent to the muscle cell or to the cells in general and to motor neurons in particular here uh, and will produce uh, and synthesize uh, cement very rapidly to prevent the loss of further motor neurons. So this has been done uh, in humans as you all know this was the, the first clinical trial uh, designed um, and, and performed at Nationwide Children's in, in uh, uh, Ohio, in the United States uh, by uh, Professor Jerry Mendel uh, in a subgroup of patients first but then they extended it to to more people and, and this, they, they just observed the same positive impact with the, this is the job intent score which shows improvement over time in the majority of them except those would have been either treated uh, late or treated with the low dose of uh, the gene therapy product and all this uh, led to uh, a great excitement that was uh, already uh, four years ago uh, because these kids really um, survive but some of them will uh, even develop uh, as normal children if you treat them quite early that is either pre-symptomatically uh, such as in this uh, little girl shown in, in this slide so just an update, uh, as you know, the original biotech uh, apexes have been taken up by Novartis. Um, to my knowledge, uh, 300 children, exclusively infants, have been exposed to Zolgen smear to date. The, the, the safety profile is good in general, but uh, we did observe a few uh, serious uh, adverse effects uh, recently, especially the TMA, the thrombotic microangiopathy. Uh, which might be treatable, but still, it's 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 quite a concern, and it's sometimes uh, lethal, at least in one case. Uh, there was, and there's still a, 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 a clinical trial uh, trying to deliver intrathickly uh, the uh, Zolgen smear, um, especially in type two patients, uh, but it's currently uh, halted due to uh, safety concerns, not in humans but in in primates. Uh, we also uh, observe uh, nowadays uh, that some children uh, combine both therapies actually. They are either on spin rats at first and then on uh, uh, spa or vice versa. Um, we're also talking about gene therapy followed by every stay. So all this is a moving target but uh, that's something that will be considered in, in some patients. And again, the, the problem of uh, access to, to such a huge, I mean, uh, such a costly uh, drug is, is, uh, is there, uh, despite the compassionate uh, program uh, provided by the company. So uh, again, and to summarize what's happening in SMA, um, we do have drugs now. Um, they are all uh, having a, a, a real, and significant clinical uh, impact and benefit. Now the question is uh, how far can we go? I mean uh, how far we're we going to improve uh, our patients and this is still a pending question. Uh, for those treated pre-symptomatically there's no issue. They, they do get better and uh, it's, it's, it's really fantastic. For others, especially those who are already having symptoms and, and sometimes significant symptoms, um, the outcome is probably less, uh, more uh, questionable. And now, at last but not the least, uh, I'd like to say a few words about uh, 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 what's happening in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Uh, just to remind you that we started many years ago, decades ago, by the description of the disease, and we are now entering an exciting era where we have at least uh, four, if not five uh, different drugs approved for such a disease. So you remember it's a progressive fatal genetic disorder uh, leading to uh, um, disability first, uh, leading you to wheelchair and later on with the ventilatory uh, insufficiency and uh, cardiac compromise leading to uh, early death. So that's the natural history of the disease. And so it's pretty common in the sense that it's 
the most and the most common form of muscular dystrophy worldwide. It affects only males because it's an X-linked disease. And uh, from a therapeutic viewpoint, uh, things are also going fast. Uh, this is just uh, the, the pipeline of the various companies involved in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And we're going just to address some of them. Uh, and I think on top of the list is the, the uh, gene therapy again, uh, based on the microdystrophine. Uh, all this being uh, using an adeno associated uh, virus. So remember, uh, we're talking about dystrophin, which is this huge protein here in yellow, uh, which uh, raise, which uh, result in Duchenne muscular dystrophy when it's totally absent, or in uh, Becker muscular dystrophy, a milder form of the disease, when it's partially uh, uh, absent. This is the, the, the gene, okay, composed of 79 exons, and this is the full length dystrophin protein uh, generated by this uh, immense and huge gene. Uh, so, based on that, um, and this is the full length protein, uh, some people said that perhaps we could try to remove the uh, use less or less useful. Uh, parts of the, the, the protein to, to see whether it works or not. And the truth is that it works. In other words, um, if you have a shorter version like this, the mini dystrophin, you still have an activity I and mean, the, the protein will be functional. And same if you use the micro dystrophin, it's even a shorter form of, of this. And so Based on that, uh, various groups have, have designed um, microdystrophins, and they've used it first in uh, animal models, such as the, the dog model here, where it showed some expression and some sustained expression after a uh, uh, local injection of the, the, the transgene. All this is still exciting and led many companies to enter the arena of clinical trials for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, Sarepta, Pfizer, Solid Biosenses, and uh, Geneton, and there will probably many uh, others. Um, unfortunately, well, it's not an uh, easy journey um, because um, some of these uh, programs either stopped uh, because of uh, serious uh, side effects, as uh, for instance, in the Solid Biosciences uh, program. Uh, there have been a stop and go uh, periods, uh, and nowadays they, 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 the trial is definitely uh, stopped, unfortunately. But hopefully, the Sareptas one is doing uh, much better, even though they haven't achieved the, 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 the final clinical outcome or endpoint they, 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 they targeted. But still, uh, it's been uh, designed and, 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 and run properly in a number of uh, patients, and all this is uh, again promising. Pfizer, and this is the, another Sareptas uh, trial which is uh, in the pipeline. Um, Pfizer um, is also having its own gene therapy program for Duchenne, and they have dosed a number of kids nowadays, and they're trying now to expand to a, a, a three uh, phase three trial. And now uh, Geniton is also in involved in the develop in the clinical development as such a microdystrophin uh, medication and uh, we're targeting uh, 40 uh, Duchenne boys in our own clinical trial so that was about gene therapy using micro or mini dystrophin and the other uh, very exciting uh, th uh, field is eggs and skipping uh, so eggs and skipping as you remember is based on the fact that we know perfectly well uh, the composition of the dystrophin gene made of different exons and introns and, and so on and so forth. And since the, the, the various deletions or duplications or whatever uh, found in the dystrophin gene um, impact the, the reading frame and just based on that uh, we can play with exons and trying to remove one or to add one uh, to restore the reading frame. And if you restore the reading frame, then you'll be able to uh, produce some degree of uh, functional protein. 
and that's for instance what we do for uh, eggs and uh, 50 uh, one uh, skipping here you have uh, the wine type protein and the wine type uh, genotype here so when you have a deletion in exome 50 which is pretty common in, in Duchenne voice um, then the reading frame is, is uh, impaired okay but if you manage to skip that exon 51, you will bridge the gap and have a, a, a continuum between 49 and 52. And therefore, uh, you'll have some degree of uh, protein and this will be translated into a partially functional uh, protein. So for that, um, you obviously need to know what's the composition of your uh, population in terms of um, exons being deleted or, or not and as you can see here the, the, the skippable exons are here and the percentage of them or uh, deletions are uh, listed in the databases uh, are here okay so in other words uh, if you target exon uh, 51 you'll grab and target 13 percent of all Duchenne boys in your population uh, with exon 45 and exon 53 you will target uh, another 8% respectively. So taken together that means that exon skipping therapies are currently addressing 30% uh, of Duchenne mutations. It's not bad but, but still we're missing all these others for which we have no solution than, but other than uh, uh, gene therapy that we mentioned uh, before. This is the current situation uh, for exon skipping in terms of uh, pharma companies uh, involved. Uh, and again, um, well, the, the company Sarepta from the US is pretty much involved in that. As you can see here, they have at least three oligos marketed nowadays. Uh, there's only one Japanese company which has been recently approved for well, the uh, exon 53 uh, skipping. And uh, keep in mind that we're also going to see in the near future um, other early goes, um, the tree cyclo DNA uh, early goes, for instance, and the, the PPMO, which is a second generation form of uh, this is just um, take a message for the X and skipping. Again, um, I must say, even though this requires more data, that the, the clinical impact is pretty much limited so far. Uh, it's not dramatic as it could be in SMA for instance, but still it works. It, it improves a little and it, it's probably just the beginning because with the newest uh, uh, um, drugs to come, uh, we may have more um, efficacy. The good news is that uh, all these early goes are, are safe, even on the long run, apparently there's no problem. Uh, I mentioned the fact that the four FDA approved uh, PMOs uh, cover only 35% of DMA, uh, DMD patients, so they are unmet needs for which we need uh, to, to, to work. Um, and as I said, uh, there's now uh, new drugs, new oligos in the pipeline that look very promising, at least in animal uh, models. And um, some of them, some scientists even imagined or envisioned the, the combination of uh, both therapies, that is using exon skipping uh, combined uh, with uh, gene therapy, for instance. I'm not going to comment the third approach, which has been uh, used and called atelurin to read through uh, stop mutations, uh, because the, the, at this point, the, the drug, which is called uh, atelurin, um, it's targeting also a limited number of Duchenne patients. Uh, it's now available in a growing number of countries, although it's conditionally approved. Uh, but in my experience as well, and to, for many others, uh, clinical impacts in uh, limited, I would say. Just to summarize what's happening in Duchenne, um, and this is the, the, the good news, uh, there are many tr clinical trials uh, many kids have been exposed to uh, clinical trials in the past and, and currently. Uh, we have now six FDA approved drugs for Duchenne, which is very exciting. 
uh, and the, the the pipeline, as I showed, is still expanding and it's very impressive. Uh, there's a growing number of farmers uh, entering the arena, and uh, we do have clinical trial centers in place uh, to run all these trials. Uh, and there's a productive crosstalk between uh, various stakeholders, the, the PIs, the, the patients, the advocacy groups, the regulators, and, and so on. But at the same time, we, we do face challenges in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. I mean, the efficacy uh, looks a little poor or limited. Uh, safety concerns, especially with gene therapy, and I mentioned, um, access to these drugs, because they're still very expensive, is still an issue. Uh, and we'll probably need more reliable biomarkers uh, soon. But we may face a shortage of participants in, for clinical trials, we don't know, and that's why we need to really involve more countries. Uh, and again, we, we have issues with fake news, fake drugs, uh, that's going to be a, a major challenge in the near future. And again, we need to find a good balance between hype and hope, and, and, and obviously, if we want to avoid uh, controversies in this field. Um, three slides to finish. Uh, first of all, um, I mentioned all these cutting-edge therapies, which are very exciting from, from, the, from the scientific and, and clinical viewpoint. But never forget that prevention is also key, uh, and that's why you know, we're now uh, seeing a number of initiatives uh, related to newborn screening in neuromuscular diseases. You all know the principles of uh, this uh, approach, which is prophylactic by definition, and also uh, from a pragmatic viewpoint, uh, is quite useful to, to diagnose early and then to treat early, uh, meaning that the, your intervention will be more uh, efficient. So it's already implemented in a few countries for a few neuromuscular conditions, and I've just listed some of them. For Pompe disease, for instance, it's widely used in Taiwan and the United States. Uh, you can detect that on a Guthrie card using a DBS, a dry blood spot. Um, and nowadays in spinal muscular atrophy, uh, it, 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 it is becoming a must, even though we have pilot programs only in, in many countries, such as the one listed here. And for the first time, we're going to, to do some molecular genetics on, on the Guthrie cone, which is also a technical uh, challenge. And for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, we had, we had had pilot studies in the 70s, but they haven't been very successful. Uh, but uh, with the, the advent of this um, micro dystrophy program, whatever, the, the pressure for uh, restarting um, newborn screening in Duchenne muscular dystrophy is now uh, a, little, a little bit higher uh, on the agenda. Now, um, we must be uh, cautious, and this is the, the, the slide where I'm just addressing the myotubular myopathy issue. Uh, this is a devastating disease where infants are very weak at birth and they die very early. Uh, hopefully, we had a, a gene therapy program uh, by a dentist which showed that we were capable of uh, uh, improving significantly the natural history of such uh, a disease. Um, but, and this is due to the, to the viral vector itself, uh, we, we observed tree death and therefore the, the, the trial has been uh, halted by uh, the regulators most probably because of liver toxicity. Uh, so the message is that, okay, gene therapy, we are so much excited about, um, is still a, a, a very, uh, I shouldn't say hazardous, but we are taking some risk, okay? And uh, so we probably need to work better at the bench side to improve our vectors and, and to make it work uh, more safely, I would say. Okay, so my take home message for you guys, is that, uh, yes, therapies and, and neuromuscular disorders, is, this is a very fast-moving, uh, exciting field. Uh, and, and therefore, it's a plea for an accurate early diagnosis in every patient in which you suspect neuromuscular disease. We do have now cutting-edge therapies, uh, and that's very, very good. Uh, and never forget, yes, you, you should provide hope to parents and families 
and patience but at the same time you shouldn't sell too much uh, the, the newest therapies as miracle drugs and finally I'd like to acknowledge patients families advocates clinicians scientists industry and obviously the ECNA for this uh, opportunity to give a webinar on such a nice topic thank you for your attention